now and right so uh, no rather than unfortunately i am not going to be able to unmute uh, anybody for the class uh, whatever you have to discuss you can send me a text message and uh, if you have any doubts etc you want to clarify you can also text message me later after the class okay. uh, now in the last session we saw some important theorems like uh, parallelogram law and the triangle law for subtraction of two vectors and very importantly the triangle inequalities that is the maximum and minimum values of magnitude of resultant or magnitude of difference and things like that and uh, yeah raj please let me continue with the lecture right now you can discuss your personal doubt with me after the lecture so this way i will not make any progress with the class if one by one while i am speaking you people start sending me doubts so yeah, yeah i will give you time don't worry i am not able to reply to your message till now it must be because uh, i didn't find the time yet but i will reply to you okay so now coming back to this uh, yeah some more couple of people joining in yeah right so we are talking about the two more people coming in quite late now so we discussed about the triangle law uh, inequalities and all that so let, let me quickly take a recap of those things okay so the important recap points from last time's lecture so what we saw is that when you look at the addition of two vectors so for the addition triangle remember the vectors are joined head to tail like this so this is the angle between them it is the exterior angle of the triangle and the sum becomes this particular vector so I'm sure you are very used to it by now so all this you see so the resultant sum of these two vectors inequality related to this that we saw is that since mod of b plus b is equal to root of a square plus b square plus 2ab cos theta and since theta can be anything between 0 to 180 degrees so that means cos theta can be anything between minus uh, sorry, between plus 1 and minus 1 but minus 1 occurs for 180 degrees and plus 1 occurs for 0 degrees okay. so that that implies over here that the resultant of a and b cannot under any circumstances exceed the magnitude of a plus the magnitude of b and cannot any under any circumstances become less than the difference of them so this was one important inequality concept that we saw okay. but apart from this we also saw that because cos 90 is equal to 0 we also saw that if mod a plus b is greater than square root of a square plus b square that means that the angle is acute and on the other hand if mod of a plus b is less than root of a square plus b square that means that theta is greater than 90 degrees so it's an obtuse angle so these are two additional small points that we saw okay and uh, finally we also saw the triangle law for the difference of the two vectors. Okay, so, for the difference of the two vectors, we have seen that if the original two vectors are given like this, this is the vector A and let's say this is the vector B, then as per a vector triangle, when we want to find the difference, what we'll have to do is we'll have to draw vector A and to that we'll have to add the negative of vector B. So, if this is vector A, this, this one was vector B pointing in this direction upwards. So minus of vector B will point in this direction. Okay, so it will be a vector of magnitude B only. But its direction will be opposite. Okay. So hence, if this angle here was theta, the angle between A and B. So here the interior angle becomes theta. Or the angle between the vector E and the vector minus B. That angle in fact becomes 180 minus 
So the original direction of the vector B was like this. So this angle was theta. So minus B is opposite that. And therefore, the sum of the vector E with the vector minus B becomes nothing but the vector, which is the difference of it, E minus B. So from that, we saw that the magnitude of this vector E minus B becomes root of E square plus B square minus 2AB cos theta. And therefore, similar kind of inequality principle applies here. Okay. And then finally, we saw that if we combine these two triangles, the vector triangles, we get a very interesting result, which is the parallelogram law. Okay. So again, with reference to our original two vectors, if our original two vectors A and B are like this, then this time, instead of drawing triangles for A plus B and A minus B, we construct the vector parallelogram. So for the parallelogram, what we do is, we draw the two vectors A and B, not one after the other, like we would do for displacements, but we draw them from a common origin, like we would do for two forces applied at the same point. So the vector A and B, they just picked up and they are drawn from a common origin point. That was the first step of the parallelogram. Though. So A and B are like this. So in the vector triangle for the sum, this used to be the exterior angle, but now the angle between A and B actually becomes this interior angle. That's the first step. Then we complete the parallelogram by drawing two sort of helping lines which are parallel to this. You can see that the above dotted line that I've drawn is actually A only because this side is A, so this side is also B. And this side is also B in length. Okay. So that completes my vector parallelogram that is constructed by two adjacent sides being the vectors A and B, like I explained the steps. Okay. And finally, in that vector parallelogram now, this particular diagonal the one which is going from the origin to the opposite vertex, which we call the primary diagonal, that becomes A plus B, it becomes the resultant sum. Whereas the other diagonal, which is going from the tip of one vector to the tip of the other, or from head of one vector to head of the other, that becomes the difference. Okay. So for example, if I'm going from the head of B to the head of A, it is A minus B. Whereas you can also understand that if I reverse this, it would become B minus C. If I, in the same diagram, you will now realize okay, that if I draw this vector in the opposite direction from here to here, so it's equal but opposite to that. So that vector would represent which one now? It would represent B minus C because it's going from the tip of A to the tip of B. So this particular vector would be B minus C. Whereas the red one which is pointing from B towards E, that one was A minus B. So B minus A is actually nothing but negative of the vector of A minus B. So that is the relationship that you can see between the two arrows also. The red arrow and the green colored arrow, they are equal and opposite. So they are opposite vectors of each other. So that is the relationship. So that's another thing we saw. And don't bother to write the formula and all that again because it's the same formula for the magnitudes and the angles and all as you have for the triangle. But this is just something that helps us in you know, visualizing the problem geometrically. So we'll be coming to a lot of applications of these things today. And uh, we will see some special cases of this also today, very interesting stuff and all that. But before that, so how, how do we use, for example, usage of triangle inequality? Okay. There is this one, that mod of A plus B cannot exceed the sum of the magnitudes and cannot become less than the difference of the magnitudes. Let's see how we make use of that. So for example, this type of question, which I've given many in your exercise actually, suppose we have A plus B plus C is equal to a null vector. Okay? And given that magnitude of the vector E is let us say 100, and the magnitude of the vector B is let us say 160, suppose. Okay? Now I ask you that therefore, C's magnitude can be, okay, can or may be, whatever, which of the following? Because I give an option like this. I see that option A, can it be 120? Okay, option B, can it be, let's say, 70? Okay, option C, let's say, can it be 200? So, let's say, can it be 300? 200, 200 is being obvious. Can it be 300? And option D, can it be as low as 40? So now you can see over here that in this we will be directly making use of the uh, this thing, the triangle inequality. Okay. Yeah, 
Dheeraj, to, I will be discussing your homework and all that, uh, and Piyush, to answer your question, why we are considering the diagonal as the result here? Because see, within that parallelogram, you can see the triangle norm. Why this black color diagonal is equal to A plus B? Because that is what we have done in the you know, vector sum wala triangle. If you, if you recall in the sum triangle, what we have done is, this was the vector E, this was the vector B. And this angle was theta. That is the angle between the two vectors. And therefore, just like you visualize displacements, E plus B becomes this. Now you can see that there is nothing new in the parallelogram law. This triangle is present in the parallelogram. Okay. This triangle here, this one, is the same as this triangle here. No difference at all. So that is why this diagonal is actually becoming the sum. You know, so actually, this is coming from here only. It is picking up this triangle and placing it there. Similarly, the difference of the two vectors was A minus B, that one. So that triangle is present over here. If you just compare the triangle for the difference which you've drawn above, compare that triangle for the difference drawn over here. Look at this triangle A minus B. That's present in the parallelogram. In the parallelogram, that triangle is over here. So that difference wala triangle is actually here. This is what I have used to construct the parallelogram. And then this is So this is my A minus B. So if you look at this, this triangle is present. It's the same triangle. Okay. It's the same thing. It's just I've used different sides, but you can see that this side above here, this is the vector E only. It's the same as this vector. And if this vector is B, then this vector here is minus B. So this very triangle, it is redrawn over here. So the triangle involving this diagonal is actually the vector difference color triangle. And the triangle involving the primary diagonal, this one, this triangle is the other triangle involving the primary diagonal. So that is the whole point of parallelogram. You know? Parallelogram is the AP point actually. There is nothing new in it as I told you. Okay. It is just that you combine the two triangles so that every time you don't have to draw separate two triangles to analyze them. You are able to analyze the sum and difference within the same geometrical figure. That is one thing. Then the other thing is, see, this triangle diagram, it makes sense if you are talking about displacements. Physically, it makes sense. That I made a displacement of A, then a displacement of B, so I landed up here. I started from here, so the resultant displacement should be this. But how does it make sense when we are talking about forces, for example? Because both the forces A and B would be acting simultaneously at a given particle. So why would we draw the forces like this? We would want to draw the forces like this and try to understand what the resultant force is. So in that kind of situation, for those type of vectors like force, momentum, etc., this, this diagram makes more logical sense compared to this diagram. Though actually they are one in the same. Okay. So why can't the other vector be of the same direction? The other vector be of the same direction, beta. This is the vector B only. They are exactly the same direction. They are parallelogram, so they are parallel sides. So, you know, there's no difference between this side and this side. Okay. All right, so let's come back to this question. So, so yes, I have started getting some answers for this. Uh, Aditya answer is correct, very good. So, yes, uh, Kevin. Your answer is also correct. Yes, Devansh, your answer is correct. Piyush, your answer is partially correct. Mehak, your answer is also partially correct. See, Devo, I don't know the angle. I don't know the angle. So, angle could be anything. That means the angle could be anything between 0 degrees and 180 degrees. So, it could be anything between 0 and 180. That means magnitude of A plus B according to our triangle law, could be anything between the sum of the two. So that is 100 plus 60, uh, sorry, 100 plus 160. And the difference of the two. And that is why you always write the difference with the mod. 
because a can have a magnitude which is less than b so then we should not write this as minus 16 because the magnitude of a vector cannot be minus 16 so that's why there is always a mod on this side because even though a's magnitude might be less than b's magnitude we will never report the difference between them as a negative quantity no? because we are talking about the difference in terms of the magnitude of a vector so magnitude of a vector by definition is a quantity that does not have algebraic sign we don't say it's plus or negative we just say it's an absolute quantity so what this is telling us that the magnitude of a plus b we only know one thing that it cannot be more than 260 and it cannot be less than 60 अपने पास अभी यही इन्फॉर्मेशन है वी डोंट हैव एनी अदर इन्फॉर्मेशन सो फ्रॉम दिस इन्फॉर्मेशन यू कैन सी कैन इट बी 120 इयर्स कैन इट बी 70 इयर्स बट कैन इट बी 300 नो बिकॉज़ दैट्स मोर देन 260 कैन इट बी 40 नो सो इफ दिस इज अ मल्टीपल चॉइस क्वेश्चन आई हैव ऑलरेडी गिवन यू एन एक्सरसाइज दिस टाइम विद मल्टीपल ऑप्शंस सो दिस इज मल्टीपल ऑप्शंस करेक्ट टाइप ऑफ क्वेश्चंस ओके व्हिच इज नेक्स्ट लेवल ऑफ एमसीक्यूज फॉर जे टिल नाउ टिल वर्कशीट 3 आई हैव गिवन यू प्रॉब्लम्स व्हिच वर only about uh, this thing you know single option correct but now i'm i've started giving you some additional type of questions the more than one option is correct like the five questions i gave you in worksheet 4 that section 2 was like this so here you will get marks in your paper only if you mark a and b if you mark only a you will get partial marks you will not get full marks for it. so for example if it is a four mark question for only a you will get one mark for only b you will get one mark For A and C or B and C or C and D or any such combination where one of the wrong options are marked, you will in fact get negative marks. Whereas if you mark both A and B correct, you will get four marks out of four. So that is what we mean by that partial marking. So we anyway, don't worry about marking scheme just now. We will explain more about that to you. So, yes, uh, Viraj, I will. Uh, I will be doing the worksheet problems also. So I'm coming to that. Don't worry. I, I will be discussing most of the worksheet problems today itself. so but this is just giving you an idea about how we make use of triangle block so similarly for example if i say that suppose i say mod a is equal to 12 and mod b is equal to let us say 5 and magnitude of a plus b is let us say 9 and then i say the angle between them must be zero degrees 90 degrees acute or obtuse okay so again these are those type of questions they are little bit more tricky because you have to understand the inequality principle over here so you have to compare these okay now you can see that a plus b is how much it is 70 You can see magnitude of a minus b is how much? It is uh, how much? It is seven. Okay. And what about root of a square plus b square? That is thirteen. Okay. So now, if you see in this question, what is happening? Yeah. So I'll just check your answers. Okay. Uh, Yes, they want your answer is correct. It has to be obtuse because you can see that the value is nine. So this is nine. That means mod of a plus b. What we are understanding now is that mod of b is becoming less than root of b square. So this is what we are learning. So that means that is obtuse. Okay, that means that cos theta. Is a negative quantity. We don't know yet how much theta is, but we can see. So for this, you know, you don't. For this, you don't have to sit with a calculator and actually find out the value of theta. Yes, Piyush, uh, I will. I will tell you that. Just try to concentrate first on what I'm saying over here. Okay. Vector calculus is something different. We will learn it after learning about calculus. Okay. So it cannot be zero because had it be zero, it should have been seventeen. It cannot be ninety because had it been ninety, then it should have been thirteen. There is less than thirteen. It cannot be acute because had the angle been acute, then the magnitude of would have been definitely greater than thirteen. So you can see that if the magnitude of a plus b was greater than thirteen but less than seventeen, so this would mean it is an acute angle. 
if the magnitude of a plus b is less than 13 but greater than the difference 7 that means it is an obtuse angle we can see all these options we can see only. Whereas if the magnitude of A plus B had been exactly 13 over here, that would mean that theta is equal to 9 to If the magnitude of A plus B had been exactly 17, that means the angle would have been 0 degrees. They would have been parallel vectors. If the magnitude of the resultant had been the difference that is Seven. I know that theta would have been one eight, but you can see that these are not happening. This is not happening. This is not happening. This is the one which is happening. This is the one which is again not happening. Okay, so a you know, couple of more people in a waiting room. So just hang on a second. So this is how we handle these type of questions, the inequality based questions. So yes, I will come back to the worksheet and more questions based on this. Okay, so this is one of the things I wanted to start with, the revision of the inequalities and the parallelogram law. Now, as I, as I promised you, I will take you through the worksheet problem, don't worry. But first we will continue with some theory ahead. So we will now come back to components actually. And now we will understand components in three dimensions. In three dimensional coordinate frame, or you can say three dimensional Cartesian system, or whatever. So, here, first of all, we have to understand a rectangular 3D coordinate frame. It has three mutually perpendicular axes, x, y, and z axes. Now, this is where our visualization becomes important now because we cannot rely any longer on just pen and paper because that's two dimensional. So, you have to pay attention and understand this diagram. In this diagram, what I'm doing is this is imagine it's actually a wall like this. These are actually perpendicular to each other, these two axes. Even though in the two dimensional figure it doesn't look like this, but just visualize this as one of the walls of your figure. So this is mutually perpendicular. Okay. And then you have another axis, which is like the third edge of the room. At the floor, take one of the corners to be your origin. And visualize this now. So this is, let us say, your z axis. So this is another wall or another plane which is perpendicular to this one. This is how you visualize the three dimensional. So this angle here is also mentioned. And this is like the floor of the room. So you have to learn to visualize three dimensions by actually visualizing a three dimensional space. And the best way to do that is visualize the room in which you sit. Take any corner point as your origin. And visualize the three planes. The floor is the XZ plane. One of the walls is your XY plane. And the other wall is your. So this is the system of XYZ. This is what we mean by they are what we call mutually perpendicular. Axis. That is the meaning of the term rectangular. Whenever we use the term rectangular Cartesian system or Cartesian system, that means all our axes have to be mutually perpendicular. So x is perpendicular to y, x is perpendicular to z, and y is perpendicular to z. So this is the visualization of the coordinate frame. So I just want to take a few seconds and first properly visualize this diagram, like I've told you. And just imagine one of the corners the room that you are sitting in, that is your origin, and the edge 
the two edges on the floor are basically your x and z axis and the vertical edge to that corner that is your y axis so your floor is becoming the x z plane any point on the floor it's having its y coordinate zero but it's having some x z coordinates any point on this wall is having its z coordinate zero because it's in the x z plane and similarly any point on this wall is having its x coordinate as zero right? because it is in the y z plane See that this is the YZ plane. Similarly, this is the XY plane. And the floor here is the ZX plane or XZ plane. Okay, so another way to visualize this is just think that we are constructing. A rectangle. Like a rectangular frame. rectangular box given so now in this rectangular box this point is your origin and from the origin one of these edges this becomes your x axis this becomes your y axis and this is where the x axis Again, this is one plane. This plane is perpendicular. So that is your Cartesian system. So hope this is clear. So here, when we talk about vectors in 3D, the first thing is our base vectors or our standard unit vectors. They become i cap and j cap as usual. But along with that, now there is e cap. So this is the unit vector along positive x. This becomes the unit vector along positive y axis. And this, the new one for us, becomes the unit vector along the positive z axis. So in this diagram here, A cap would be a unit vector along the z axis. J cap would be a unit vector along the x axis, along the y axis. And I cap would be a unit vector pointing along the x axis. So this is how in the three dimensional diagram you try to depict I cap, J cap. They're all unit vectors. Okay, so we will discuss more about the nature of this coordinate thing. In fact, we have to discuss something called the cross product rule or the right hand thumb rule, which is very important in determining the direction of the z axis. Why it is pointing like this, and why I haven't taken the z axis in the other direction? Because it is what we call a right handed coordinate rule. So I'm coming to that. But first, the basic understanding of this to make sure you're clear about this. Yes, so Fusion, I'm coming to that. Salvation, I'm coming to that also. That how we decide the positive direction of the z axis. Okay. Next up, let us understand something very important here, which is. The 
राइट हैंड और रेक्टेंगुलर और व्हाट यू कॉल अ कार्टिजिम क्वाड्रेट थी because we are talking about three dimensions now what we mean by right hand so this system that we have just seen in in a sort of three dimensional diagram system now let us visualize this looking into the x y plane that means my line of sight is now like the directly to the x y plane this is my positive x axis this is my positive y axis now if this is x axis the horizontal one is x axis and the vertical one is y axis then here where is my z axis it will be an arrow coming out of the plane okay, so that's what you understand so i'll explain in detail so if my i cap is pointing like this and if my j cap is pointing like this along the positive x axis and positive y axis They are both in the magnetic plane. Then notice here that k cap, that is the unit vector along positive z axis. So that one is a vector pointing outwards. towards us it is coming straight out you understood the point it, it will be a vector that is coming out of the plane so now the question is that why do i have to take it as a vector coming out and why not the vector going in so it is not the vector going into the x y plane there is a vector which is coming out now why is this like this why do we select it as coming out and why not going in because so you know in your three dimensional diagram basically what i am trying to say is in the 3d diagram if this is your y axis and this is your x axis now if i were to just say that the z axis is perpendicular to both of these then technically i have two option one option is that the z axis could be this one and in fact according to what i have written here that is the correct option this is the correct option that z axis is coming out here but somebody might say that okay why isn't this one the z axis Which I have taken as the negative z-axis. Why isn't that one the positive z-axis? What about this? What is wrong with this? But turns out this cannot. This will not be the z-axis. And we will understand why it cannot be the z-axis. We will take the z-axis as positive direction as coming out over here because we are following what what is called the right hand. So it is not this. So the reason for this because of what we call. the right hand rule okay. so what is the right hand rule the right hand rule is like this that if any normal person who has his fingers properly oriented takes his right hand now in your right hand so basically i'll this for a moment i'll stop this screen share so you can understand So with your right hand, you have to do this. Understand? You have to do this. 
Now in this, what is happening? You have to make three mutually perpendicular axes with your right hand. Now using your middle finger, that is this one, your four finger, which is this one, and your thumb. So the right hand rule is according to this system. Now, what is that system? So if you make a system of three perpendicular axes using your thumb, your four finger, and your middle finger, then the rule is that x points along the thumb, y points along the four finger, then z points along the middle finger. Okay, so that is why z has to be coming out in this. So I'll, I'll explain this in the paper diagram. So the right hand rule over here is that using the fingers of your right hand, which fingers, the thumb, the four finger, and middle finger. So using these three, make a system of axes. That is, they are mutually perpendicular. So just try this. So use your right hand fingers to make a system of three perpendicular axes. Using your four finger, that is this one, your middle finger, which is this one, and your thumb, which is this one. Point them in perpendicular directions. Okay. Now the convention that we follow. Now once you've done this, now the right hand convention. So now. the right hand convention. This convention is that the thumb is the positive x-axis. The forefinger is the positive y-axis. And then by definition, the middle finger becomes the positive subaxis. So if you fit that into this diagram now, you will see why that is happening. On this piece of paper, now you point your thumb along the x-axis, point your fourth finger along your y-axis. So immediately you will see your four finger, sorry, your middle finger is pointing towards you. It's coming outwards towards you. So that means the z-axis is coming here towards you. So that is the logic of that convention. That is, or we can say that is the system of that convention. Now if somebody were to use their left hand, it would be the opposite convention. Their z-axis would be pointing inwards. Okay? Because they would point their thumb along x-axis, finger along y-axis. So middle finger would go into the blue. So that is the difference between a left-handed system and a right-handed system. And since we have to just follow one system with consistency, that everybody should follow the same system. It doesn't matter which one. So by, you know, just by default, you can say that we have selected a right-hand system to use in both engineering as well as in physics. In technology as well as in science, mathematics and physics, we use what is called the right-handed system. Okay, so yeah, I'll minimize all this. Let's see. Now, this is not the only way to determine the axis. I will show you another way. Okay. But this is the correct z-axis and this is the wrong one because you are following the right-handed system. If you point your forefinger along the y-axis, your thumb along the this thing, along the x-axis, then your middle finger will automatically point along the z-axis. That is how we decide the direction of x, y, and z. I'll tell you another easy way of thinking. So another alternate method. Now alternately, we can also use what is called the right hand 
bound. Now the palm rule is like this that no, so again I'm going to minimize this for a moment. So the right hand palm rule is instead of stretching three fingers like this, you just keep your palm like this. So that you have 190 degree angle. See, so you have 190 degree angle, your thumb is stretched out, and your fingers are all stretched out in the same direction. So this is your right hand palm. So your palm. Now the convention is that you point your thumb along the x-axis and your fingers along the y-axis so then your palm is pointing your palm is pushing outwards the palm is facing in which direction that direction is your z-axis so this this is the explanation of the right-handed system or the rectangular quartet frame using the right hand palm that wherever your x-axis is point your thumb along that wherever your y-axis is point your fingers along that so now wherever your palm is facing in this case it is facing like this facing outwards it's, it's facing outwards like this, facing outwards. So that will become my z-axis. So if this is my x-axis, if this is my y-axis, then my z-axis here, by default, will have to be which one? It will have to be facing outwards. It cannot be facing inwards like this. Why? Because my palm is facing in the direction outwards. So now I'll explain that on paper. And this one is actually easier to draw for me also. So I'll explain. So the right-hand palm rule is that when you draw your x and y axis like this this is your positive x axis this is your positive y axis of course you have negative x and negative y then what you do is alongside you draw your right hand or you stretch your right hand palm such that the thumb is along positive x-axis and all the four fingers are pushed along the positive y-axis. So when I do that in this diagram, when I place my palm such that it's obeying this instruction, then it will be something like this. Now you'll have to excuse my poor drawing skills. Four fingers are like this, and now the thumb is pointing. This angle is pointing. This one is your thumb. Your thumb is pointing along the x axis. Your four fingers, they are pointing along your y axis. Positive y axis. And this is your right hand. If so for lefties, it's a little tricky. You have to remember to forcefully use your right hand. So you place your right hand like this. Now, your palm points, so your palm faces along the direction of positive z-axis. That's how we determine that the direction of z-axis here is coming. Try this all of Put your right hand thumb along the x-axis that you've drawn on paper in front of you. Point your fingers along your y-axis. So automatically you'll see that if you draw them the way I've drawn on the paper here, your palm will be pointing towards you. It won't be going out. It will be pointing towards you. So then you know your z-axis is which axis. It is the axis that is coming out towards you. No, no. So that is the thing, Viraj. The, the thing is that in the convention, we are drawing the, we are comparing the positive x, the positive y, and the positive z. So obviously negative x is lying opposite to x. Negative y is lying opposite to y. We don't have to consider the negative x-axis. We have already considered x-axis in this. So my x prime axis is this one. The negative x-axis is here. The y-axis is here. So obviously I know that the negative y-axis is here. Y prime is here. But now what does that mean? This the z-axis is coming out. If the z-axis is coming out, then what about the z prime axis? It has to be going in. Now, which is the rule that tells you that it should be coming out and it should not be going in? That is your right hand palm. See, that is your right hand palm. That when you point your thumb along the positive x axis, not your negative x axis, when you point your fingers along your positive y axis, then where is your palm pointing? It is giving you the direction of your positive z axis. Alright, so that is why I have not mentioned the negative axis at all over here because I don't want you to get confused with the negative axis. Okay, 
the moment you have placed your x y z positive axis you automatically know where is your x prime or negative x axis you know where is your y prime or negative y axis and you know where is your z prime axis so you don't need to worry about those three axis yeah so raj to answer your question why z is taken by this rule it is just taken for the sake of consistency so that when i write the laws of vector algebra or consequently from that the laws of vector physics any vector application in physics it is consistent with anybody else who is using that so this we will fully understand when we discuss about cross product okay we will understand this fully when we discuss about cross product or you can think of it like this now that if i am writing the coordinates of some point as plus 1 plus 2 and plus 3 then for me to understand the same thing as you are understanding the z axis must be consistent na agar maine z axis ko right hand rule se liya hai and somebody else has taken by the left handed system then i will place the point at a different point and you will place the point at a different position so it is for the consistency in understanding that to what is the correct rotation that is why we are following a convention that is why i said that this is not a law of physics okay it's not a natural law it doesn't come with some unwritten rule it comes according to the convention that we as human beings are following that we are taking a z axis according to the right hand system instead of the left hand system ah why left is not used that is anybody's guess uh, but i think it was because in ancient times uh, the church used to frown upon left handers they used to feel that left hand has something to do with the devil and right hand is the correct hand and all that the my my own thinking is probably it has something to do with those kind of religious things uh, nothing against left handers now those people know that left handers are more talented or at least equally talented than right handers nothing wrong about that but it is just that we have to follow one of the two right or left so which one we end up ended up following we ended up following the right one and that is now something that is decided okay so whether we are applying this in physics or in mathematics or in technology okay, in engineering you will see when we design machinery that machinery specification is always according to the uh, right handed rule if you wondered why your nuts and bolts always behave that rotating anti clockwise makes them coming out and rotating clockwise makes the bolt going the reason for that is because they have been machined in that if you look at the screw of your bolt the screw has threading now the threading is done in a certain direction if that direction was reversed then it would have behaved the opposite way then rotating the screw anti clockwise would have pushed it in and rotating it clockwise the pull would pull it out but because it is machined in accordance with this right hand rule which we will understand in stages okay today we are just understanding x y z system but next lecture when we understand about cross product and we understand more about these things then you will learn that there is more to right hand rule it is not just about the placement of x y z axis but it is also to do with cross product okay. now at this stage i'd like to verify for all of you people that cross product will not be coming in the test which is uh, on next to next weekend okay the test will be only up to dot product only up to what we are discussing today yeah let me just go through some messages which have come up yeah so raj to answer your question if everybody followed the left hand rule there would be no issue but then some of our laws would be written in a different way compared to their how they are written today but yes the problem is if some people use right and some people use left that that will create big issue because then our laws will not be consistent for our equations to be consistent everybody has to universally use one common convention so that convention by just a matter of choice is that it is a right handed convention just like you know we have a system of units in physics you know the standard international unit we use meter for length we don't use feet it's a matter of convention and service to answer your question unit vector along the negative x axis is just minus i prime if you want to point if you want to draw a unit vector which is looking like this in this diagram to answer your question if in this diagram i want to draw a vector of magnitude 1 along this direction that vector is nothing but minus i prime this vector is minus i cap its magnitude is 1 this vector here is i cap its magnitude is 1 this vector here is j cap its magnitude is 1 Whereas this vector pointing downwards is minus j cap. Whereas this vector, which is coming out towards you, so for that you will have to understand three dimensionally. So three dimensionally, if you draw the diagram again, so this is my y-axis, this is my x-axis, and this is my z-axis. So this is that flow, this is that x-axis. So in this, my a cap 
would be a unit vector which is pointing like this. It's along the positive z-axis. This is k. Whereas this vector pointing along the negative z-axis will be the minus. Whereas in the same diagram, this vector pointing upwards would be j prime. Whereas a vector pointing along the negative y-axis would be minus j prime. Plus i cap and minus. Fusion trigonometry, the negative and positive is decided according to clockwise and anti clockwise. The convention in trigonometry is that anti clockwise angle is positive and clockwise angle is negative. So, if for example, trigonometry wise, if I ask you that you know, what is this angle which I have drawn over here as let's say 80 degrees, it is actually positive 80 degrees. But if I were to show the same angle of B with respect to A like this now, this is suppose 60 degrees. Probably, I would say it is minus 60. The angle of B with respect to A is minus 60. So, that is to do with clockwise anti clockwise. Now, interestingly, clockwise anti clockwise is also to do with right hand rule only, but that is in a slightly different way. I don't want to confuse you today, so I am not going to explain about the uh, right hand uh, logic in clockwise and anti clockwise yet. Just yes. Oh, don't worry about trigonometry in 3D. Okay, it's it's not coming up just now. Trigonometry will not come up in 3D. We will just use component notation. Okay. So let, let me first actually just let's understand the application of right hand palm or thumb rule. Next, let's just practice. Application of Right hand rule. Right hand palm rule. Whichever of the two you want to use. My advice is use the palm rule. It's less messy. The three fingers, you have to remember which one is X, Y, four finger, middle finger. It becomes really confusing. Palm rule is very easy to do. Now, what I'm going to draw in each of these, in each of the diagrams. Find the direction of the positive z axis. This is my y axis, this is my x axis. Second one, like this. Now, third one, a little different. Okay. Now, the third one, I'll explain like this that. This is your north, this is your east, west and south. Now in this what is happening, my positive x-axis is pointing towards Pointing 30 degrees north of east, and my y axis is pointing vertically upwards, pointing vertically upwards. So my positive z axis is pointing here. So I'll just minimize this so you can see all three parts and just start sending your answers. Okay, let me check the answers.
refuse to an- answer your question from earlier why we need unit vector if its magnitude is 1 because we need the direction no beta one on its own is just a scalar quantity a unity is just a number it's a scalar but if you want to give it some direction that 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 quantity of magnitude unity is pointing where is it pointing along the x axis is it pointing along the y axis so we have to convert it into a vector of magnitude one so that is why we need the base vectors we need the unit vectors only then we can express the direction of any vector in terms of the unit vector like that first one. yeah it can be explained by something else like i have given over here that 30 degrees north of east and all that but then that becomes very lengthy na huh? in physics and maths we want some very simple you know mathematical kind of way some equation based kind of way of expressing the direction so that is why we avoid words like this that so much of like description so many degrees east of north and this and that so we don't want all that we just want some very consistent easy equation solving kind of method so that is why we make you know unit vectors unit vectors are just like tools actually they are tools that make vector algebra easier for us to handle okay so now let me start going through the answers so let me see your answer for the first one is uh, uh, no beta you have to i hope you haven't confused the x and y axis this one is the x axis the first one you can see this is the x axis this is the y axis groove okay. uh, yes your answers are correct uh, but for the third one you have to recheck your answer first and second answer you prove you are correct okay. aditya first and second you have to give the answer in terms of whether it is coming out or going in so if you mean by upwards you mean coming out then your first one is correct but your second one is not correct aditya and in the third one you have to give the answer according to north south east west In the first and second, you don't give in terms of north south east west. You just show in the diagram itself whether it is coming out or going in. Yes, it is. You got it correct now. Raj, you got both both of them correct. third one i'm still waiting for the right answer for somebody oh yes third one i have got one right answer very good i have got the right answer by uh, aban qureshi you got the correct answer Yes, Vashis, you have also got it correct. Yes, first and second, most of you have got it correct now. Okay, Aditya, your answer is also correct for first and second, and third, you have to just specify a little more in terms of angle. Okay, so let me come to each of these questions. Okay, so in the first one. you can see that if you point your thumb along this direction along the x axis and you point your fingers then you see your palm is over here it is facing towards you and this is your thumb these are your four fingers the palm is facing towards you so that means in this case where is the z axis the positive z axis it is coming out okay it's coming straight out towards you like this okay so in the second one also very interestingly if you point your thumb along the x axis and your four fingers okay like this you will see that your palm is still pointing towards you only you don't see your knuckles the knuckles are on the other side You see, your palm is facing towards you. So that is why here also, what will happen? 
z axis is coming on okay. just as a variation i'll show you that suppose i had this now suppose i had this that the x axis was here but the y axis have taken downwards for whatever reason i'm free to select x and y as i like it doesn't always have to be vertically upwards like this abhi now if you point your thumb in this direction and your fingers like this you will see that you see your knuckles here your palm is actually the other side your palm is facing away from you if you point your you know, thumb and fingers like this you will see this is the way the palm is the other way. so this is these are your knuckles This is your thumb. These are your four fingers. So your palm is actually pointing away from you. So in this case, what will happen? Your z-axis is going into the plane of the paper. or both i have not given this question but suppose it was like this so the first and second part they are both coming out and most of you got the first and second part correct they are both coming out so i'm just minimizing this a little bit for you first so you understand not only the first and second but this additional case i have given also then we'll come to the third one don't worry we'll come to the third one but understand this so again see i am repeating there is never any restriction on x and y axis only restriction is that they have to be mutually perpendicular so there is no rule that i have to take the x axis towards the left or towards the right or anything or if i take the x axis towards the left then y must be downwards if i take x towards the right then y must be upwards as a koi bhi rule nahi according to the convenience of our solving any problem we can select x and y anywhere we like as long as they are perpendicular to each other but once we select x and y then a z axis has to be consistent with the right hand rule so what we mean by consistent with the right hand rule it is this one that if you point your right hand thumb towards the x axis and you point your you stretch your right hand fingers towards the y axis then wherever your palm is facing that direction in which the palm is facing that is the direction in which the positive z axis is there okay guys so matlab don't get too stressed out by this okay because uh, it is going to be quite a bit of analysis few lectures when we before we start understanding the full application of this but since we are getting into three dimensional coordinates today it's a introduction into three dimensional coordinates so we have to understand the convention properly that how we draw our x y z axis okay so now with that let me come to the third part okay. so in the third part see what is happening is that i'll redraw it this is my east this is my north this is my west and this is my south okay now in this where is gravity or the vertically downward direction is going into the plane it's like you know you're looking at the floor a horizontal surface has x y has north south east west okay so this is actually this is a horizontal plane so in this horizontal plane that is the plane of the sheet over here that's a horizontal plane so vertical is which direction it is the direction which is coming out okay. so just imagine you drawn this on the floor actually you know you kept a compass on the floor and you drawn this on the floor so you're looking into this north south east west axis on the floor now your your vertical axis is where it is coming out of the plane okay now in this it is given to me that i have drawn my x axis for whatever reason i have selected my x axis to be 30 degrees north of east so my x axis is here okay this is my x axis 30 degrees east of north it is pointing 
from sorry, 30 degrees north of east. Right. So I think this is what I had written. Or was it east of north? North of so it's five minutes. But what about my y-axis now? Y-axis is actually coming out. Okay. So that I can't show in this diagram. Y-axis is actually coming out of the plane. So what you'll have to do now is you will have to place your hand in a very strange kind of way. You'll have to point your thumb in this direction. Okay. And your fingers have to be out towards you. These are your fingers. These are your four fingers. So now if you do that, your thumb is like this and your four fingers are like this. You will see this is the direction in which your palm is facing. Palm faces in this direction. So you see that this angle will be 90 degrees. Okay. So now you know where your z-axis is lying. Your z-axis has to be over here where your palm is facing. So your z-axis has to be this one. This has to be your z-axis. This is your positive z-axis. Okay. Of course, you have the negative z-axis on that side. So that's why you have z prime. So this, this is where you are. And your y-axis is coming out. So this will become how much? This is 90. So this will be 60. Okay. Or this is 30. So you can say that the z-axis points. at 60 degrees south of east okay. or you can say the same thing is at 30 degrees east of south no no may say may do be more that is fine but so long as it's clear that it is pointing correct so you got it so you know the immediately right now in physics we won't come across something so complicated okay so don't worry about this immediately just, it is something for us to gradually learn and understand in detail that how our system of coordinates is decided by using our right hand palm rule. Ah, we can say it is below, but the thing is how many degrees below? We have to be a little bit more specific over here. So we'll say like this. Abhi, you will not get a question like this in your test or anything. Don't worry. Okay. You will get the type of question which I am giving in the worksheets only. But this is just so that you understand that if I draw my x, y axis like this, then how do I decide where z axis is? So yes, Yashmit, in the, in the diagram that I have drawn for the third part, the z axis is actually pointing straight towards me. Okay, When I am looking into that north, south, east, west wala plane, so just imagine you are looking into the floor. And these boxes that are there in my whiteboard, they are just the tiles on the floor. So this is your north, south, east, west direction. Okay. So this is the floor. So here, where is the y-axis pointing? It's pointing straight towards me. And it's vertically upwards. No? So when you look into the floor, gravity is pointing straight away from you into the floor. So where is anti-gravity or where is the vertical direction? It's pointing upwards. So that is why you can see I have placed my palm like this now. Over here. Right hand is placed like this. That my thumb is pointing along the x-axis. But my four fingers, I can see that tips. No, those circles that I've drawn, they are the four fingers that are basically my tip. So my hand is actually placed like this over here. My hand is placed like this is my thumb. And my fingers are actually here. These are the tips of my fingers. These are my four finger tips. They are pointing towards me. Pointing outwards. From the plane of the paper. So if I place my palm like that, you know, that you can see the tips of your fingers pointing towards you and your thumb is in this direction, then you will automatically realize that your knuckles are on this side, the knuckles will be on this side, and your palm will be on this side. So this is where your palm is facing. Palm faces in this direction. So that is why that is becoming your y-axis. So it's it's a little bit complicated. That's why I'm spending a lot of time in this. Okay, now see, we can try and make a make a three-dimensional diagram to understand this even a little bit better. But before that, let me minimize this so that it's really clear to all of you. Okay. So 
if I were to now draw the diagram like this, that and I'm trying to draw a diagram in which all my directions are in the same thing. So this is the north side south wala line and this is the east west wala line. We just have to imagine that this is on a floor. So these are the tiles of your floor. This is your horizontal plane. This is the horizontal plane. Where this is your uh, east, correct? this is your north, and this is your west, and this is your south. And which is your vertical direction now? Your vertical direction is becoming this one. This is the one which is perpendicular to this. This is your vertical direction. So mutually perpendicular like this. So this is your vertical. If you drop an object, gravity will make it go like this. So vertical is opposite to gravity. So now in this diagram, see where I have selected my x-axis. I have selected my x-axis. I have selected my x-axis in this plane at 30 degrees. So it is in this plane. Okay. And where is my y-axis? My y-axis is here. Okay. So now you point your thumb along the x-axis and your fingers along the y-axis. So your palm is actually like this now. See? Your thumb is like this and your fingers are like this. And this is your palm. These are the lines on your palm. Your palm is pointing like this. This is your point. This is your point. So that is why in this diagram now, where is my z axis? My z axis is here. So it's lying in this plane. It's lying in that southeast color plane, such that this whole angle here has to be 90 degrees. Okay, so if this is 30, then this angle has to be on. Has to be 60. So 30 plus 60 is 90. So that is why my y-axis, I'm sorry, my z-axis is pointing like this. It is 60 degrees south of east. Okay, so hope uh, this is somewhat clear because you know, honestly, you know, you're trying to do something which is next to impossible. Trying to make a three-dimensional figure on a two-dimensional plane. Okay, so but Still, with our imagination, we should be able to you know, understand what's happening over here. So that is about. Okay. So for the moment, you don't need to worry about anything else. You just need to know that if I draw two x and y axis only, then how you will decide the direction of the positive z axis? If I know the direction of positive x and positive y, how you can always use your right hand thumb rule to find out your or your right hand palm rule to find out your direction of the z axis. That's all. This will become significant. Again, after a couple of classes, don't worry. Okay, but, okay. So now that we have done this, so we have understood the 3D Cartesian or uh, what we call rectangular coordinate axis. We have understood that and we have understood our unit vectors I cap, J cap. Now, just like we have i cap, j cap, and k cap along the positive x axis, positive y and positive z, minus i cap is along the negative x axis, minus j cap is along the negative y, and similarly, minus k cap is along z prime or negative z. So, those are always there along this. Okay. So, now any vector in component form in 3D is expressed like this. It is some scalar quantity into i cap, that is called the x component, plus some scalar quantity into j cap. That is your y component and some scalar quantity into k cap that is your z component. This is one terribly wrong with my box over there. We'll catch it later, don't worry. So this is the vector in 3D. It is the vector in three dimensional component form. Okay. 
वेर अगेन एक्स ई वाई एंड ई जेड आर रिस्पेक्टिवली द एक्स कॉम्पोनेंट और वी कैन आल्सो यूज द टर्म प्रोजेक्शन दे ऑल इन इंटरचेंजेबल ऑफ वेक्टर इन दिस राइट इज मोर क्लियरली सो दैट सो कंफ्यूजन लेटर so this is the x component so similarly ey is what we call the y component or projection of the vector and ez now the new one is called the z component capital z okay and we understand that these quantities ex ey and ez they are actually scalars the vector part is in the unit vector so when we multiply the scalar with the unit vector the whole thing becomes a vector okay so it's right so there are scalars which can be positive or negative so this is the expression of any vector in three dimensional component form just like in 2d it was ax i cap plus ay j cap in 3d it becomes ax i cap plus ay j cap plus ez j cap now note this down and next i will just explain to you how to visualize this now now what this means uh, this vector in 3d what it means uh yes uh, service uh, and we should to answer your questions nishit right i'm oh, sorry viraj yeah uh the application of 3d up to what we are doing today will be asked in the exam but you will see that the application is very easy like when we are adding vectors subtracting vectors the way we we did for 2d we just add the third component for 3d so there is in the application part there is nothing difficult only the understanding part initially for the z axis is a little tricky all right so yeah so i'll i'll explain we'll understand how one vector is projected in all three axes just a moment right so now let us understand how this is working out okay so let's think of the interpretation of this okay so for example suppose we have a displacement vector s which is let us say three i cap plus four j cap plus let's say twelve j cap so let's see what this exactly means okay so suppose our coordinate frame the way we drawn it in three d actually looks like this x y and z axis to give you a visual feel of this that we are the mutually perpendicular planes now how to interpret this vector let's understand okay so in this diagram now let us first plot the vector phi i can what is that vector so that is this vector 
this is the only n entry. Now see, if I were to just put a point over here, plot a point P, which is having coordinates x coordinate 3, y and z coordinate 0 and 0. Then you would realize that this vector which I have written about 3 i cap is nothing but the line, the vector joining or the arrow joining the origin with this. This is the vector. This is 3 i cap. In this diagram you can see that the 3 i cap is the vector OP. That is 3 i cap. Understood? Now similarly if I draw another point is somewhere over here at 0, 4, 0. Then I can understand what is the vector 4 here. Understand if this point is B, then this is the vector. So this vector now represents you understand. And similarly, if I draw another point on the z axis now, so over here, which is at 0, 0, 12, if I draw this vector and I label this endpoint as C, so C is the point having this coordinate, and I can see that 12 k cap is nothing but that vector, it is OC as a vector. There's three mutually perpendicular lines. Okay, hope you understand it. Each of these vectors is three mutually perpendicular lines. Okay, so let's first take a stock check and understand what we've done till now. So what I've done is the given vector which I had which was 3 i cap plus 4 j cap plus 12 k cap. Okay, I've broken it down into individual vectors. 3 i cap. Okay, so that is OA. 4 j cap. So that is OB. And similarly, 12k cap, that is this. Now, what is my original displacement vector S? It is 3i cap plus 4j cap plus 12k cap. So, in my diagram, what is the displacement S becoming? It is becoming a displacement like OA plus a displacement like OB plus a displacement like OC. So for that, to understand that now, what I will do is, okay, so, but first of all, make sure you understand this. Okay. Tell me this, a doubt in this over chat. Okay. So whether you understood that why 3i cap is this vector. It is the line joining, it's the vector joining the origin with this point A, which is 3, 0, 0. So this three units along the x-axis. This is similarly, this is four units along the y-axis. Okay. I will come to your message. Just give me a moment. Okay. And similarly, this along the z-axis. Each of these vectors is this. Okay. Now, yeah, someone to answer your question, they need not be on the axis. They are movable. Okay. So, for example, I can pick up the vector OE or 3 i cap and bring it here. There is no problem. But I should not change its magnitude or direction. So this vector, if I just pick up this vector OA and bring it here, there's no problem. This is still 3i. I just picked this up and brought this here. Similarly, I can bring this somewhere else. It's the same vector. It's the same thing. It makes no difference. Okay. Yeah, Pius, I'm coming to that also. Okay. So now, so far we just understood how we've drawn 3i cap. 4j cap and 12k cap. Now we have to understand how we draw this. Okay. For this, just visualize what I am saying. Next. Okay, so hope this diagram is clear to all of you. Okay. So now, next thing you visualize is that I am drawing a rectangular box whose edges are actually those axes. My drawing may not be terribly accurate, but you 
we get the idea. So I'm drawing like a rectangular frame. Actually, because of the spatial effect, that these lines don't appear to be parallel. Then you see, now, this face is closer to you, so it'll always appear to be a little larger than the face at the back. You know, that. so that's why there will always be a bit of inconsistency when we draw. And I'll try to minimize the inconsistency by time. They should do for now. So now say I've drawn this, which is actually part of that coordinate frame I've drawn. Here. So this continued in this direction is my x-axis. This continued in that direction is my my axis, and this continued here is my z-axis. And where the three are meeting, that is my origin. Now let us say this point was e. It was e comma zero comma. E. This point was b. Which was zero comma four comma zero, and this point was C, which was zero comma zero comma twelve. Okay, so back to that, my vectors were these. This was three I kept. This was four J kept, and. This one here was twelve feet. Yeah. So now you start getting an idea of what I'm trying to do. Very soon you'll understand what it means to add the three vectors. So this was how much four j. So now we want to visualize our net displacement vector, which is the sum of three i cap plus four j cap. Plus twelve. So how would we do this? Okay. So think like displacement. So you started from here. So your first displacement was three i cap. So you reached here. But now from here you have to make a displacement of four j cap. So what you have to do? You have to pick up this four j vector and place it there. Place it over here. So when you place that four j cap vector on top of this point e, because you already made a displacement of three i cap. So now from there you are making a displacement of four j cap. So where you reach? You reach this point. After completing this displacement, you will reach, let's say, this point B. Or its coordinates? What will happen? Its coordinates will be three comma four comma zero. Okay. And now from the point B, so you have completed this displacement. So starting from your origin, you made a displacement of three i cap. You reach the point B. Then from A, you made a displacement of four j cap. So you reach the point D. And then from D, you are making a displacement of twelve j cap. So you are making this displacement vector. But where should this displacement vector be placed now? It should be placed over here. So you have to pick up that displacement vector from there, and you have to draw it now over here on top of B. So then you are reaching this point, let's say, which is E, okay. and this is 12 J cap. So you are reaching this point whose coordinates are becoming 3 comma 4 comma 12. So now you completed your net displacement X. So you have to understand that this green colored vector is the same as this one. It's twelve k cap only. Its origin is a different point, but it's parallel to that vector and it's of same length. So this is a rectangle. So, so now where is your net displacement in this? It is the body diagonal. It's it is the body diagonal of this two point. So this vector now becomes your net. You can see that your net displacement now is the vector O E, where P I cap was what was O to E, then A to B was four J cap, and then B to oh sorry not A to B, A to D. A to B was this one, and then finally B 
This is the proper way to understand how that vector looks. Actually, literally visualize this in the room in which you are sitting. Take the two edges on the floor as your x and z axis, and the one edge on the corner wall as your y axis. And just imagine that your room, your rectangular cuboidal uh, kind of room, is this rectangular cuboid that I've drawn over here. So the body diagonal of the room that is nothing but the net displacement. If each of the sides of the room are your X component, Y component, and Z component. This is the interpretation. So, the words. So, hope this point is clear. Yeah, I'm coming to the magnitude. Now the interpretation becomes like this, that any time we have a vector, therefore, any vector ax i cap plus a by j cap plus a z cap, it is basically body diagonal. Rectangular cuboid of sides or edges, you can say AX, EY, and EY. That is what the vector represents. This represents the body diagonal that particular rectangle, uh, rectangular cuboid, and the magnitude of that vector is simply given by this formula, which is square root. Of a square plus b by square. Yes, so in this case, the magnitude of the displacement will become square root of 3 square plus 4 square plus 12 square. So that is 9 plus 16 plus 144. So that is 169. So that is. So this is what you need to understand in terms of visualization, uh, that cuboidal diagram that we made. And this is what you need to remember in terms of formula, that given the x, y, and z components, the magnitudes are square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. That better because it's coming from the theorem of uh, diagonal of a cube. No? You can very easily show that the cube of, uh, uh, sorry, a cuboid's diagonal, if the, if the sides are L, B, and H, length, height, and width, the body diagonal is how much? It is square root of L square plus B square plus H square. That you can show by using Pythagoras theorem twice. So you can show this very easily. Welcome to that. I'll explain.
Yes, yes, with whatever we are discussing today's class is coming in next week's test. We have like almost 14 days, at least some 12, 13 days to go. So. So this is very easy to show why the magnitude is this because you have to just use the geometry of cuboid. So I'll just quickly show you the geometry of cuboid. So let's say this is my cuboid where I have labeled this point as this C again this point is D this point is D. Now just pay attention. Now let's say this side length is L. This side length is B and this is the depth. So let's say now what I want to show is that prove that the body diagonal OE should be of this magnitude L square plus B square plus B square. So we got, if we can prove this then our vector thing is done. So for that we actually what we do is we use Pythagoras theorem twice. So just a second I have some people who are got logged out and are back in the waiting room so just a moment yeah okay so now what you do here is first you just concentrate on this triangle I'm telling you look at triangle O A D so just so for that but you just look at that piece so you don't have to worry about anything else Point O is here, your point B is here, your point B is here. This is of length L, this is of length B. Okay. And so in this, what is the side length OB? It is root of L square plus B square. There's no doubt about it because this is a right angle triangle. So this is the first thing. Okay, so I'm just giving you a comparison of the two. So what I've done is in the above diagram, first I've just brought out this space, OADC, this space. I brought it out and just I've drawn this diagonal OD. That's not the body diagonal I'm looking for. The body diagonal I'm looking for is OE, but I've just brought it out right now. Okay, so that's this. Okay. Now next, what you do is next you look at. Triangle OED. Now, next thing we will look at triangle ODE. For that, first let me place the triangle in this diagram only. Then I show it separately. This was now listen to what I'm saying. We have to place this triangle. Wait, I'm just drawing it better. Let's do a better job of this.
okay so in this triangle i mean in this diagram again this is the point b this is the point b this was the point e this was the point c okay so now i was asking you to look at this triangle od so where does this triangle lie first of all let's try to understand that so this is the line od and this is the line oe understand so now the triangle that i am talking about is actually this triangle this triangle okay so i am now separately drawing that triangle here so when i draw that triangle here look into it from this side okay so i am going to look into it from this side so it look like this Now the big question mark is why this angle is ninety. You can understand that OD is in which plane? It is in the x y plane. This is your x y plane. This was our x axis to begin with. Was your y axis, and this is your z axis, and this side B E, this edge is along which axis? It's along the z axis. So the edge B E is along z axis. So that is why they are perpendicular, okay. and that's it. Now you're done. Now you know that this side O D, uh, sorry B E, this side is how much? It is the width, so it's actually B. Okay. So our O E should just become square root of O D square plus B E square. Okay. Now from the previous thing, we just retain the value of O D. So the value of O D is root of L square plus B square. So fit that, and you see you get a very simple. So this is the geometrical proof of the fact that the uh, you know double application of Pythagoras theorem. This is the geometrical proof of the fact that the body diagonal of a cuboid is square root of the length square plus the width square plus the height square, okay, l square plus b square plus b square whatever. And that is why the magnitude of a vector a x i cap plus a y j cap plus a z k cap should become root of a x square plus a y square plus a z square because that is the interpretation we just found. That the vector sum of a x i cap plus a y j cap plus a z k cap is just the it is the body diagonal of a cuboid that would be formed of sides a x a y and a z. Hmm. So see again in that diagram you visualize it or draw it and I mean just visualize it in the room in front of you. Okay. So one of the walls is that plane O A D B. Okay, that is lying in the x y plane, whereas the the line d e is on the other wall, which is perpendicular to it. So d is like that edge of the wall on top, which is perpendicular to the wall which you are seeing in front of you. So o d is the diagonal of this wall, and d is the side of the other wall which is perpendicular to it. So you see that they, they are perpendicular to each other. So the line o d is lying in the x y plane, whereas the line d e is lying along the z axis. So by definition, they have to be perpendicular. Because one is along the z-axis and the other is in the x-y plane. Yeah, so it's a little difficult to visualize directly from the diagram. But if you convert this diagram into visualizing in 3D, like I told you, taking your room as the cuboid that I've drawn over here. That's of course assuming that all the edges are perfectly 90 degrees. With modern-day architecture, it's not always. So, question based on what we learned yes, here so far is just I have given you one already. Na? 3 i cap plus 4 j cap plus 12 k cap. Find the magnitude of the vector. So, it's very simple. It is root root of 169 or 13. So the, till now, what we have learned that is the only application question. That's why I have not given you more. Okay. 
things will come no man will come up but nothing more difficult is coming up for uh, this week and next week okay after that when we do cross products that will be for the next test it will not be for the first test coming up cross product will be a little bit complicated but up to the first test there is nothing more difficult in veterans the worksheet 4 will be the the one which you will have to put maximum time into i'll give you a worksheet for today worksheet 5 but that will again not be difficult for you and worksheet 1 2 and 3 hopefully most of the questions are complete if anything is pending make sure to discuss with me you can contact me any time with doubts for that and if you as i think many of you have seen that i try to do my best uh, if required i'll send you a solution or anything like that yeah so we know it is a right angle fuse again because see that line od it is the diagonal of one of the walls that is your xy plane and that line de is the other edge you know so it is perpendicular to that wall so de as you, as i have written on the side over here you can see that this side de is lying along the z axis is parallel to the z axis whereas the other one od it is the diagonal of that Which is in its x. So any line in the x and any line along the z axis, by definition, they are becoming perpendicular. So you know this diagram is how you how this triangle would appear if you look at it like this. You are looking into this direction. So that OD and E, this triangle that we okay. so this is about your you know, magnitude of a vector expressed in three dimensions okay, so now we have come back to this point where we understood up to here that when we express a vector in three dimensional component form ax i cap plus e by g cap plus z k cap automatically we understand that the magnitude of that vector is given by this formula okay. now the next part will be very simple okay. sum and difference so a vector e plus a vector v going to be ax plus bx i cap plus ey plus by j cap plus now one more component that similarly if the sign is minus between them so nothing difficult now from this point onwards So now let's see an example question. So you notice now while I am giving you the example. So Okay, so this type of question, you can see it is nothing much, really. It is just about proper substitution, and just being careful not to make any mistake while you are solving. So the application in this so far from things that we have learned, addition, subtraction, etc., in three D is very simple. Okay, just try this question out. It will wind up in another 
five to ten minutes. Yes, Dhruv, uh, your answer is correct. I just came in and saw. So let's, let's work it out here. So the vector E plus B, for example, will become 1 plus 0. Either, because B doesn't have an X component. B's X component is 0. Plus 1 plus 1 plus 0 plus 1 because E does not have a Z component. So E plus B is becoming I cap plus 2 J cap plus B. So this is the vector E plus B. Correct. So its magnitude is magnitude of x plus y plus z that kind of thing. So the magnitude of a x i cap plus a y j cap plus a z k cap. It's always square root of x square. So that's one square plus y square. That's two square plus z square. That's one. So it's becoming square root of four plus one five plus one six. So root six is the magnitude of So the vector E plus B in component notation is this one. And its magnitude is root 6 in this. In this, in this.
Now similarly, let's work out. Yeah, I've got some correct answers for the second part also. For the second part, I have to now work out this thing. A plus B minus C. So that will become A is X component, which is one, plus B is X component, which is zero, minus C is X component, which is one. Into I cap okay. plus now A is Y component which is one plus B is Y component which is one minus C is Y component which is in fact minus one. So C is Y component is minus one. So A plus B minus C. J cap plus now A is Z component is zero. B is Z component is one. C is Z component is also one. So this is becoming just three J cap. So this is the vector E plus B minus C. So its magnitude becoming 3. So that is root of 0 square plus 3 square plus 0 square. x square plus y square plus z square. So it's just a very simple extension of what you've been doing in two dimensions, two, three dimensions. And there's nothing difficult about this part. The tricky type of questions are still there in worksheet 2. So it works with four next. Okay. Now coming to that worksheet, I just give you a hint in a couple of questions before we complete up. So first of all, uh, so I think this is clear for everybody. I should not be clear. So next, just to wind up, worksheet four. First of all, there are a couple of corrections, some typing errors. In question one, the correct answer should be C. C is the correct answer. At the back, I think it is given as E, that is wrong. Okay. Then in sixth question, the correct answer will be that P minus Q is equal to 10 J. By mistake at the back, it is given as 20 J. The answer is that is wrong. That's about the correction. Now, just to give you a few hints. So, for example, the second question. In the second question, it is given to you that two mag vectors of magnitude. So, let's say the two vectors are in. They are both having magnitude 5. Okay, that is given to you. And it is given to us that 
the difference in magnitudes i mean the magnitude of the difference e minus b ka mod wo kitna hai that is 5 root 3 so to find the angle between them so use the statement of triangle law okay? that mod of e minus b is equal to root of e square plus b square yes minus 2ab cos theta okay. when you work this out 5 root 3 is equal to 25 plus 25 minus 50 cos theta yes aa jayega so when you solve for cos theta here you will get cos theta is minus half get cos theta is minus half which means that theta is obtuse so cos theta is minus of cos 180 minus theta is minus half so you will get 180 degrees minus theta as 60 so theta will come out to be this is for example something new for us which we had not done earlier this is an application of the triangle law second part for the difference remember in the difference there is a minus sign that comes in then similarly fourth question you will be able to do okay because we have just discussed that type of question earlier today using the triangle inequality so in the fourth question the hint is okay, use triangle inequality like we did in the early part of the lecture today so just do a quick recap of that thing and you will be able to understand this then for example uh, third question logical type of question how you solve it so third question it is given to you that mod of a plus b is equal to mod of a minus b that is given so how do we solve further expand this so root of a square plus b square plus 2ab cos theta is equal to root of a square plus b square minus 2ab cos theta so now take square on both sides so a square plus b square plus 2ab cos theta is equal to a square plus b square minus 2ab cos theta so this will tell you that 4ab cos theta is zero obviously a is not zero because otherwise the question would not make sense i have not given you null vector b is not zero so that means cos theta must be zero so that means theta must be 90 degrees so it implies that the vectors are perpendicular that's all it implies it also implies that when cos theta is equal to 90 degrees that magnitude of a plus b which is equal to magnitude of a minus b that actually becomes how much it becomes root of a square plus b square this is also then fifth question also use that inequality concept as i told you fifth question it is mod of a plus b is greater than root of a square plus b square when theta is acute and less than when theta is obtuse so use that theorem sixth question write a and b in component form in i cap j cap form and solve you can simply get the answer the easiest way to do in this question okay seventh question now seventh question is something like this that the magnitudes of p and q you have to find their ratio 
okay, and the angle between them is 150 degrees. So that means the vectors are actually like this. If this is the vector P, Then the vector Q in a sum form triangle would have to look something like this. Where this angle is 150 degrees and the resultant of these two is actually perpendicular. So this angle is 90 degrees. This is So now you can just use uh, this thing. Huh? You can just use the fact that this angle is alpha. This is P and this is Q. You can see that P by Q is equal to cos alpha, which is cos 30. That's it. So from that you get P is to P. Very simple. That's one way you can do the question. Another way you can do the question is that. You can also take a standard coordinate frame and express your vectors P and Q like this. So the vector P would be some PI cap and because this angle is 150 degrees, when you express the vector Q, Q will become its magnitude into cos 150 i cap plus its magnitude into sin 150. So it will become cos 150 is minus root 3 by 2. And sin 150 is plus half. So plus q by 2. So you express this and this like this. So p is in vector form. Q is in component form. Now P plus Q, this resultant, this is perpendicular to P. So now in my diagram, where is P? It's lying along the x-axis. So when you do this P plus Q here, this resultant vector, this should be along the y-axis. So that means this resultant x component should be omitted, it should be zero. So that's another way you can solve the question. So both both are convenient over here. The geometrical method as well as the component method. Both are equally convenient. You can do it by either method. You express P and Q in component form. Now add P and Q to get the resultant and put the condition on the resultant that is x component should be zero. So get the result. Similarly, in question 8, use formula or rather formulae of triangle law part A and part B. So, like we've done a couple of questions back, just substitute A plus B is magnitude and A minus B is magnitude with that formula and apply the condition and you'll see you get the answer, whatever you're looking for. Similarly, ninth question also you can do by component method. In question 9, express the vector A in component form Ax i cap plus A by j cap. So express this and the vector B you can already see is in component form. It is basically minus 10 i cap. Now you want the condition that the resultant which is just one of this. So the resultant which is A plus B, that should be perpendicular to B or along Y axis. So once again is that same thing that when you express this in component form, this resultant X component should become zero to find the condition for that.
tenth is a repeat of triangle inequality. So these are the numerical problems. Now the multiple choice type of questions, you will see that they are all repeat of this concept only till you come to 13th and 14th question, which is the hexagon one. So for the hexagon question, what I advise is you do like this, that you first of all take some coordinate axis like this. And then you draw some kind of hexagon. Taking care that two of the sides are actually parallel to the x-axis. So they are very easy to draw as vectors. So you draw your hexagon first like this. And make use of the geometry of hexagon that the geometry of hexagon is that these are all equilateral triangles. Which means that this angle is also 16. Which means that this angle is also 16. Okay. So for example, you are taking the hexagon as E, B, C, D EF like this and the hexagon side length is 20 centimeters. Okay. So for example, when you are expressing the vector EB like this, you are expressing the vector BC is like this. So all these vectors you write in component form. EB for example is 20 I cap. Similarly, when you work out BC, it's of magnitude 20, but it's lying at 60 degrees. So it will become 10 I cap, sorry, 10 root 3 I cap plus, oh sorry, 10 I cap plus 10 root 3 J cap. So like that, you express all the other ones also. Whichever ones are required, C, D, D, D. All of these you express in component form. And then just do the operation which are shown. Same way you do for 14th question also. Okay, so 13th is this way, then 14th also similar method. And the other ones are like logical, little bit of logical tricks you using the uh, triangle inequalities and also. Again, if you are done question 1 to 8 or so, which are, which are using those, you should be able to tackle them. But still, you know, these more than one option type questions are a little bit tricky. And that's why I would like you to spend some time on it logically, try and understand the options. And whatever confusion occurs, uh, if, if you can, you know, just discuss with me individually through your WhatsApp chat. Uh, if required, again, I will pick up some of the questions. In fact, some of the questions definitely I'll be doing in the next lecture again. But I want you to give it a wholehearted uh, effort uh, with, uh, you know, with the hints that I've given you today. Okay, and, and then in the next lecture, whatever questions are required, we'll be solving again. Okay, people. Yeah, so that's it guys for today's lecture. Yes, uh, now as a lot of you people are asking that you know there are more things about 3D vectors. In fact, there is dot product, cross product, there is how to find the angles with the x-axis, y-axis, they are called direction cosines, etc. So yes, we have not completed three-dimensional vectors yet, but whatever is required for our upcoming test, we have completed. Uh, we will be doing more about 3D vectors in the next lecture and subsequently in the next one after that also. Okay, because, so a lot of things still remaining in vectors. But uh, now we have completed up to sum and difference completely. So vectors is coming up to today's lecture. people. So all the things that we've learned up to today's lecture, including triangle law, parallelogram law, the component system in 2D and 3D and how to do some difference and all this in 2 and 3D, these parts will be coming in. Okay. So that's it people. Uh, thanks for attending and uh, as usual, any doubts and things you have, you can 